I actually know what I'm doing here because guess what? We don't have any fire up here to light the chalice. And because I'm not usually the service leader, I haven't asked anyone to light the chalice while I lead, read the chalice lighting words. Ren, are you willing? Thank you. There's water here to douse. Obviously, we need a better uh, service leader. Okay. <laughs> the chalice lighting this morning is The Chalice of Our Being by Richard Gilbert. Each morning, we hold out our chalice of being to be filled with the graces of life that abound, air to breathe, food to eat, companions to love, beauty to behold, art to cherish, causes to serve. We give it, we give back if we can, something of ourselves, some love, some beauty, some grace, some gift. We give back in gratitude if we can. Something like what is poured into our chalice of being for those who abide with us and will follow. Each morning we hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, to give back. Thank you, Ren. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing our opening hymn, Morning Has Come. Is this familiar to folks? 1,000 in the Teal Hymn Book. I thought it was. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to invite Declan Kiley up to read our story for our time for all ages. Need a page turner? Fergie, big surprise. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you're here, Fergie. Bear with me, I'm a little hoarse this morning. From the stars in the sky to the fish in the sea. This congregation is fully supported by your gifts and your offerings. But before we do that, I just want to thank Declan and Fergie for that wonderful story and uh, for doing it with a plum. So what does it mean to be fully self-serving, self-supporting? It means that we have to support ourselves, that there isn't a regional or a national or an international body that 
sends us a monthly check. We do that for ourselves and we appreciate all your support as members and friends. And I invite the ushers to take up the offering as I, as I talk. We invite everyone to share with your gifts and your talents and your time and your treasure and they are in, the baskets are in the office. If you don't know the code, I could tell you, but then everybody knows the code. <laughs> Find someone that knows the code. Oh dear. Maria, could you help? She knows the code. Thank you. Wow, I got it. I got everything figured out today. I'm not used to being the service leader, can you tell? I just need to practice more. That's right. Oh, don't, Alara, Alara said, I'll probably never forget the baskets again, and I would like to say that I probably will. <laughs> yeah. So each month we share our treasure with worthy organizations, and these organizations could be local, national, or international. And this month we are sharing our undisclosed, the money that goes in the baskets with the food bank, and you can see how to, on the screen to donate to them. Many of our folks use an automatic, automatic withdrawal from their bank account to support this congregation. And if you wish to do that, uh, you can email the office or Andrew. And I believe, no, it's not. There it is. In, yeah. There we go. All of the things. They're right there. So that's, that's super helpful. That's a really great slide. So when I first got here, it was like post-COVID just, and we, we had previously been a food bank depot, but it had stopped. And so um, Dosha Lisney was a member here, and now she's moved back to Calgary. But her pushing and my understanding was, uh, because of her pushing, I understood how important it was to have a food bank depot here at, Uni at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. And so we started one and now we're up to about 40 families. Is that correct, Susan? More like 30. Okay, we, we support, or about 30 families come here to pick up their hamper every Wednesday. And as they do so, I believe it's a real blessing and a wonderful gift that we offer the food bank. So, and with that, we will sing our thanks, thank you song from You I Receive. Our next hymn is Wo Ya Ya. How many know that one? Lots of you. Uh, okay. <laughs> just follow along. It's easy. It's best if you actually don't even look at the words and just follow along. There's not a whole lot of words and some great harmonies I hope we hear. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are willing and able. And sing 1020, Wo Ya Ya.
I invite you into a spirit of meditation, of calming your own spirit, your own bodies, your own breath. I invite you to settle into your chair, feel it holding you, supporting you, allowing your mind to wander or to focus as you choose. I invite you to follow your breath as it enters your body, giving you what you need, and then letting go that which you no longer need, which no longer serves you. I invite you to take a couple more deep cleansing breaths. I offer this Buddhist ancestry prayer. Dear ancestor spirits, please hear our prayer. Remind us to breathe deep in each moment, touching our lives from within as we honor you there. Remind us to reach back to you who were here long before we began counting time or needing labels to describe ourselves as human beings. You goddesses, warriors, and kings, healers, priests, shamans, two-spirit, family, and friends, share with us your wisdom that we may know the power of community and understand we are already one. We need only self-love and compassion so that we can truly let each other in. Dear spirit, creator, higher power, goddess, God, universe, mother, earth, you who are calling us forward, remind us that we are deserving and enough. There is enough space in this world, in in the hearts of this world, and in our communities for all of us to be, do, and have all our heart's true desires to be safe, loved, and happy as our authentic spiritual selves. Dear spirits, we call on all of you at this time to come and breathe with and through us as we walk our paths toward equity and freedom. Remind us that each breath is not just for this moment. This moment is the important one. It's also for our future. With you, we remember that no matter where we are, when we can be truly present, we can and do create our future. In remembrance of our sisters, brothers, and others, our our kindred, our siblings, and others lost to violence in all its forms. Please hear our prayers. Amen and blessed be. I invite you into a time of silence.
Dear spirits, we call on all of you at this time to come and breathe with and through us as we walk our paths towards equity and freedom. Remind us that each breath is not just for this moment. This moment is the most important one. It's also for our future. With you, we remember that no matter where we are, when we can be truly present, we can and do create our future in remembrance of all we lost to violence in all its forms. Please hear our prayers. Ashe, Aho, Amen, and blessed be. We'll just take a couple more moments of silence and then we will move into our time of candles, of care and concern. And I'll speak to that. Let's we'll take one moment of silence. As we think about what is in our hearts and minds, as we let those thoughts and feelings bubble up and become present in us, I invite you into a time of lighting candles of joy or concern, whatever is in your heart at this time. How is it with your spirit? I invite you to light candles as you see fit. The candle stations are open on each side and Karen will graciously provide some background music for us. Thank you.
Oksana, if you could stay there and light one last candle after you've lit your personal ones, please. A last candle for all of the joys and concerns that we hold in our hearts that may or may not even be in our conscience. Thank you. As I mentioned, oh, sorry, I will wait. I'm sorry, Anne-Marie. Thank you. We'll wait for Fergie. Thank you. So today or tomorrow is a transgender day of remembrance. A time when we recognize those that have been murdered, hurt, struggled with their gender identity. When I went to seminary, I was I graduated from seminary about six years ago, approximately. And so I was there for three years. And when I got there, there was a trans woman named Lisa Salazar. And I have permission to talk about her from her. She is a pub she has done her autobiography. It's called um, Transparency, the life of a life, the story of a life well lived. And she is an advocate for trans folk. She taught me a lot. I knew nothing. I am embarrassed to say some of the things I thought and said were completely inappropriate. And even though she didn't need to teach me a darn thing, her kindness and caring towards me was insurmountable. So thank you, Lisa. And she's really happy to come and talk to us at any time as well through the magic of Zoom if we wish to have her do that and maybe even have questions for her. Today, it's not my turn to talk though. I have two speakers, or I, two speakers have agreed to, to talk today, Lynn Markham and Alara Stefania Godet, two members of our congregation. And so, without further ado, I ask Lynn to come up and um, share with us. Thank you. There's bells up here. They're really cool. <clears throat> My name is Lynn Markham, and I am a transgender woman. So I didn't prepare anything for today because I figured I have all the lived experience. Um, the challenge with that is where do I start? So my entire life, I've always known that I was trans, but not ever spoke it out loud or even told it to myself. I'm going to be jumping around a lot, so bear with. Um, one thing I did want to say is the difference between transgender and cisgender. Now, if anyone has any type of um, science background, you're going to know that trans and cis are used in science a lot. And the definitions of trans and cis, cis is the same side of, and trans is other side of. So that's where transgender comes in. So I'm transgender, which means that I was identify as the gender opposite that I was born of. And if you're cisgender, you identify as the same gender that you were born of. Now, in the real world, you can see trans used in a lot of different ways. In Canada, we have a Trans-Canada Highway. It's the same thing. It's a highway that goes from one side to the other. Right? We have a Trans-Mountain Pipeline. Same thing. So 
I just wanted to clarify that some people aren't really aware of that aspect and the fact that it is the word trans is used in very daily lives that are just not as known. Um, for me, I have done lots of advocating work. Um, I used to be the chapter leader for Edmonton PFLAG. We actually were going to host our meetings in this church at one point, but then pandemic and lots of different things and it didn't end up happening, unfortunately, but it wasn't my sole decision. Could you say what PFLAG means? PFLAG, yeah. So PFLAG stands for, hmm. Yeah, it's a little outdated. So PFLAG stands for um, parents, family or friends? Yeah, parents, family of lesbians and gays. But that is a little outdated. Now PFLAG has not changed their acronym just because it's well known. And that's why they keep, they keep it the way it is. But I believe their slogan now or their motto is um, like family for all. And it's just a general support for, typically it's geared towards the parents of transgender youth and or trans people and their loved ones, cared brothers and sisters and stuff like that. And I think I did it for about five years. So in the five years that I was doing it, um, I got lots of phone calls from parents who just found out that their kids are trans. And they were always really hard conversations to have. They were typically always over the phone. And the biggest thing that I always told every parent is support. You need to support your kids, no matter what they decide they want to be or who they want to be. Your support is gonna mean a life and that's the truth that's the hard truth of it there's a statistic i looked it up this morning and that statistic is four percent of people that are trans with family support attempt suicide 67 percent of trans people attempt suicide without support. That is a huge difference. And that is scary. For me personally, um, for me personally, I've been down that road pre transition. It was a lot harder to move through it than after transition. And I feel a big part of that is our medical system and how it has failed in lots of ways. And more so, I wouldn't say more so, but specifically in my case as a trans person, it has failed in the way of gatekeeping. And it hasn't just failed me, it's failed numerous of other people. To, uh, to elaborate on what gatekeeping is, gatekeeping, gatekeeping is, could be as simple as a psychologist or a doctor saying, I don't want to give you this medication, hormones or puberty blockers or anything like that until we deal with your mental health. Well, your mental health is based because, or your mental health is bad because you can't get those things. So if you're stopping that person from getting that mental or getting that life saving drug, it'll help their mental health in the long run. In my experience, that happened with my addiction. So I am a recovered alcoholic and it, when I was seeing the doctors and stuff before, they kept telling me that I need to quit drinking. And I kept telling them that I need 
to start the path down the road of me being authentic to myself. And I more or less made a promise to them, be like, if you set me down the path and get me onto the hormones, I will quit. Which in turn is exactly what happened. It was probably within weeks of me getting my legal name change and hormones to when I got sober. And to this day, I've been sober. Thank you. That is my personal experience with gatekeeping. Um, I have lots of other friends who are no longer with us because of gatekeeping. And it is, it's sad. It's really sad. Um, it's, it's not easy to talk about. And I wish my friends were still here because they deserve to be here. They deserve the same care as their brothers and their sisters that were not trans. That if they came in with the same problems, they would have gotten the same medical care. They just wouldn't have had this picture painted around them the second they said they were trans. I don't really know where else to say. I'm going to leave it at that and pass it on. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. That was... Thank you. Alara Stefanik Gooday is going to speak now for a little bit. Thank you. Am I turned on? Yep, great. Uh, so my name is Alara Stefania Cadet, and I am a trans non-binary person. My pronouns are they and them. I, before I start, would like to ask the name of the person we were talking about on the way here, because I think for Trans Day of Remember, it's important to name the people we've lost. So can you remind me? Keita Allen. Allen. So I'm just going to take a moment in memory of Keita Allen, who's one of Lynn's friends that she was just talking about. And then the story that I want to tell is about one of my tattoos. I love talking about my tattoos. I have a lot of them and I have a friend, one of my very closest friends is a tattoo artist. But I didn't get this tattoo from her, I got this tattoo. I'm gonna show it. I don't know if we can zoom in on the camera if that's a thing. But what it is is a blob of rainbow paint, which was the colors of the pride flag at the time that I got it. There's some colors added in, but it's the six colors of the the old school pride flag, and in the center there's a semicolon. And I don't know how many of you know about the semicolon tattoo, but I got this tattoo a few years into being the director of religious education at when I was at Westwood Unitarian. And I got it in, not because I have had suicidal ideation, but because of the fact that I was working with youth and I wanted it to be a conversation piece. I just looked up the recent statistics today, so and I'll talk more about the semicolon in a moment, but the recent statistics are that youth between the ages here in Canada of 15 and 17 is what the study, the number, the age that the study was done on, are five times more likely to have suicidal thoughts if they are trans, and 7.6 times more likely to act on those thoughts if they are trans. So let's just think about that for a moment. We're talking about kids, okay? We're not even talking about folks in their 20s and 30s who have been closeted and haven't come out. We're talking about 15 and 7 to 17 year old this year. This is the statistic for this year. 
So back to the tattoo story. When I started working with youth at Westwood, I knew that I had learning to do, as is the case when you're working with young children. I had worked with kids with disabilities, but I had really not done much work with kids who were able-bodied before, so I knew that I had a lot of learning to do when I first came into my position at Westwood. And one of the things that I learned was those similar statistics for the time. I think it's actually gone down a little. I think it was eight times higher chances of acting on suicidal ideation in, what, about 2013, 2014? And the semicolon tattoo is a movement. I don't know, again, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but it's a movement that if you have tried to take your life, there's a break. If you've survived, there's a break. And the semicolon is that break in a sentence, and it's also the symbol that life continues on. So I got this tattoo with the rainbow flag around it in honor of the fact that I felt like it was so crucially important to create welcoming and belonging spaces as a young adult that I was at the time for youth to feel like they belonged, especially for LGBTQ2S plus youth. Because like Lynn was saying, there's parent, like parental support is one piece of the puzzle, but the other piece of the puzzle is community support. When there are adults in the lives of these youth, there's something to hold on to. There's somebody that they trust that they can go to when they're having these difficult, difficult things come up for them. And I've told the story before about how the only reason I know that I'm non-binary is because I started doing research to understand what the kids were doing these days. So, <laughs> and this is a while ago now, but, but one of the things during that time of my own questioning that I had heard was I actually, I worked with this wonderful person through the Roberts and Wesley United Church. We did some interfaith work together at the time. And when they were introducing themselves with their pronouns, they said, my pronouns are she, her, but you can practice using they, them on me. And that resonated, this is before I understood that I was non-binary, that resonated because I am a Brazilian adult and I already was at the time. So practicing on me means that you're not gonna make the mistake when you're with the youth who needs you to use the right pronouns. And that need is a real need, it's a survival need. So I really just wanna emphasize that and then I'm also, to close, going to name Bree, who was a person I was in community with, who I also lost to suicide, who was a transgender woman. Thank you. Thank you, Alara. And Alara and Lynn are, like I said, are members of our congregation and are in relationship with one another. And can I tell them what you did a couple of few weeks ago? Sure. And no, they, actually, no. no, okay, not on, the Sorry. not on the internet, right? Okay, <laughs> we'll carry on. So. Um, what is a custom during the Trans Day of Remembrance is to light candles of memory. There is a microphone here for you if you wish to speak to that candle briefly, very briefly. Um, and so the candle stations are ready. Um, Erica is going to come and lead us in this time of ritual and memory. Yes? <coughs> Surprise. <laughs> okay, I just found out about this now. Um, <laughs> we did not talk about this. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we put this altar together this morning because we want to 
honor the experiences of trans people. And the idea with this, and I spoke to several members of the congregation um, who are trans themselves or have trans people in their lives. And so I wanted to tell you about our altar. Um, the idea behind it was we wanted to uh, not have it be sad as much as this is about remembrance and um, thinking about people that we've lost. We also want to celebrate trans lives. And so um, we used butterflies as a theme of transformation for trans people. And we also wanted to honor the place that drag has in so many trans people's lives. And what is a better representation of drag than gold lame? <laughs> And my absolute favorite part, there is a brick on the, there, the altar for Marsha P. Johnson, um, who threw the first stone at the Stonewall riots, and that needed to be there. And so the idea is, if you know someone, knew someone, are someone who needs to light a candle here today, come and talk about it and light a candle. My name is Audrey Brooks, and I'll break the ice. There are many people in this church who knew Becky Hoganson, uh, who had her trans surgery in Chicago several years ago. She was a little girl who sat outside my classroom at Vic Comp, became a member of my extended family for over 24 years. I followed her journey from being G gay to phoning me one time on her way from High River and saying, Ma, she said, I'm not gay, I'm trans. And I said, are you pulled over? She said, yes. And we walked her through that with the help of this congregation who raised funds for her trip to Chicago. Um, I can't say any more except that she was my daughter and I loved her. She didn't make it because of an error in the medical profession at the time. Um, Marilyn Gaze and was helping with that, and Kathy Davies was the lady that visited him, them, every day at the hospital in Chicago. And so this candle is for Ben Hoganson. I'm Declan Kiley. My pronouns are he, him. I wanted to mention that um, I really liked uh, the explanation of the altar, so I wanted to mention what I added was a belt chain, uh, and that is to represent every trans person or otherwise who has found like a piece of themselves, a part of their identity in alternative communities, goth, metal, industrial, etc., including myself, who have found like a part of their identity that I, they hadn't uncovered in those alternative subcultures.
light a big candle. Sure. <laughs> uh, so my name is Bernard, and the first experience I had with some of the hardships that transgender people face is when I had a friend call me when I was 12 years old telling me that they were thinking about ending their life. They were 13 at the time, and that was my first brush with suicidal ideation and suicidal thought. It's unfortunate, it happens in many populations, but seeing just the prevalence within the trans community is upsetting, and hopefully someday we can do something about it. I'm lighting this candle for our friend Evelyn, who I believe is now at Westwood, and uh, how we loved and honor her always. Thank you. No, it's not. There we go. Water. There you go, you did it. <laughs> well, that took a moment. My apologies. <laughs> My name is Alex Neve. I am a transgender woman. And I realized that very recently. It wasn't a realization I knew my whole life. I think in hindsight, it's definitely something I perhaps should have, but we can always say that hindsight is twenty twenty. For me, it hit me like a brick to the face. Wasn't expected or something I was prepared for, but it was something that I've lived with and I feel that my life has improved for it. And there's a certain level of almost blissful ignorance that one can be in to issues of that nature. It's simply that when it isn't you, it's easy to just look on and you hear these numbers and you understand these things, but they feel so 
absent and they don't feel real, tangible almost. And then you wake up one day and realize that you're not allowed to visit several U.S. states. <laughs> and just like to light this candle as a, a acknowledgement of the quiet that sometimes exists around the matter of transgender people and their safety and their health. It's a quiet that shouldn't be there. Something we should be loud about and something that, that should be seen. Thank you. Alex's candle may have been a slow starter, but it might set off the sprinklers now. <laughs> I have at least two stories. I'm from Michigan, so you can come visit us. Um, my daughter, there's a, a center in Ferndale, where my house is, and it's right next to Detroit. It's called Affirmations, and it's a leading uh, LGBTQIA center in Michigan. And my daughter and I were there in support, helping them moving some things around. And she came across a young man named Lawrence, who my daughter recognized as someone she'd gone to elementary school as Lauren. And my daughter said, that explains a lot. The other story, my Unitarian Church in Detroit, we have a transgender woman. And she was telling us that she went to change her name on her driver's license and her car insurance. And she didn't change address or car or anything else. And she found out that suddenly she was going to be paying more for her car insurance because she was female. And we women thought we'd been getting a break over the kind of driving men do. Surprise. We have to hold it up and make it okay. sideways. Pick it up. You have to pick it up and there make it go. go sideways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those things are hard. You could light a lantern too. If you like it. Mm -hmm. Which would you like? Like this one. Go ahead and light and then be announced. Oh, you put you put it in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My candles just to acknowledge cross dressers and they struggle too. I, I kind of struggled, um, so I'm kind of, I'm not going to mention a name for confidentiality reasons because they are a youth. Um, but being affiliated with Reagan Youth, I quite often get Facebook messages of kids that are struggling. So my candle is just for all the youth that are struggling, that are trans, that are struggling to come out to their family, their friends, their schoolmates, and the difficulties that are ha they're having.
my candle is for the smaller pains that are more consistent, like difficulty in school systems, in switching to another name that causes small consistent pain for a lot of people. Um, bothersome things like trying having to do various paperwork and paying money to get your name changed, which for some people can be quite a process to get done. And for even smaller ones that just seem to pop up randomly for myself, uh, in for some reason, Google's fun. Um, it when I, I changed my name on my Google account, and it worked ninety five percent. In some very strange directions, my name would still come up as the previous one. I don't know why. Uh, I even emailed to ask about it, and as far as the people who use the system were concerned. My name was not in there like that, but through some strange data processing, it kept coming up just occasionally as my previous name, and that was not fun. I'm Paulette, and I want to share something other people may experience. Both my dad and my brother were cross-dressers. None of us got upset about it. It wasn't a big deal in our family. And I didn't really recognize the reasons for it or anything, but it was just accepted. And I'm so glad it was. Uh, I'm lighting this candle for a longtime member of our youth group who we haven't seen in a while, who ended up in that awful situation when they came to a realization and changed pronouns and changed names where one parent was completely understanding and open hearted and the other took it very personally because that parent had chosen the name the child had been given at birth. And I just wish that more parents would understand. Awful though it may sound, it's not about you. It's about them. And that's so important. I'm Marilyn Gay, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm just one of those ordinary people who was born a girl and have lived my life as a woman. But the candle I lit is to celebrate the support and sometimes bravery of Unitarians, ordinary cisgender people, gay people, and everyone, when we stand up against the province of Alberta and their attempt to uh, jeopardize children in the schools by um, revealing confidential information in a way that may be hostile to them, I'm reminded, I'm constantly aware of the number of homeless youth out on the streets because their parents rejected them when they came out. 
as gay or trans. And of course, the suicide statistics are have been spoken of very much. We need to support and protect our youth and our friends who are um, of, of this segment, large segment of our population. We're all brothers and sisters together. I don't think I'm turned on, so I'm just using this one. Um, I want to uplift the intersection all of the intersections, but particularly the one that I have personal experience with because we tell our own stories, right? Um, the intersection between being trans and having a disability. And it's gonna end with a note of hope, but I have been out as trans non-binary for about seven years now. And I had my pronouns used correctly within the medical system for the first time about two months ago, which is great and <laughs> we have a long way to go. Is this still on? Yep. Hey, there we go. <laughs> I neglected to mention before that my name is Erica Deneve. My pronouns are she, they. Um, that beautiful human being who stood up here uh, is my daughter, Alex Deneve, who I am so very proud of. Um, I have also had the privilege, along with Maria, of uh, being the co-leader of the youth group, uh, who are all beautiful, amazing young adults now, so we are not doing that anymore, but uh, we were part of that youth group for many years and had a few of the youth um, who did come out as transgender while we were leading that youth group, and I feel so privileged that we got to be a part of that. and. I remember things like, Declan, the first time that you told us um, your new name and just um, very shyly said that we could use that name if we wanted for you. <laughs> and that was so beautiful. Um, and I love celebrating moments like that with people figuring out who they authentically are. And it makes such a difference when we can do that for people, when we can see them as they want to be seen. And there are so many little places where we can do that for them. Even something as easy as for those of you who are on Zoom, you have an option on your little Zoom thing to put your pronouns on there. I have it on mine. And even if you are cisgendered, putting your pronouns on your Zoom account makes it easier for people who want to use other pronouns to feel more comfortable doing that as well. And that is a thing that you can do to help anybody who isn't cisgendered to feel more welcomed into those spaces too. Thank you. Wow. Thank you everyone who lit candles of joy and concern and memorial candles. And thank you, Erica, for uh, going with my complete misunderstanding of how that was going to go. I am practicing being the service leader. I have done it before. I have done a couple services in my life. Okay. But I'm going to humbly request that we skip the last hymn and go straight into the chalice extinguishing. Ren, if you could come and extinguish our chalice, please. First sip by Donna Makova. May you have a loved life. May you never diminish your mind or limit your heart. May you stand calm in a wide moment between the skies that lifts you up and gravity that grounds you. May you let loving unfurl you, then give you away. May you remember you are nest, harbor, garden. May you pass life forward, 
so that which come be, came before and that which grows in those next to you go on to those who will follow you. Thank you. And don't forget, there's a, some stuff to take out of the, the RE closet in the back and to go upstairs and then stuff to go in that. If you have five minutes, that would be awesome. And I don't have my head mic, so I'm going to do the benediction from here. Go in hope, for the arc of the universe is long, and we can bend it toward justice. Go in courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and the larger world. And go in love, because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our world. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. Amen. And let us gather in our linking song and sing, Carry the Flame. Thank you.